The year is 2001. Sony's latest creation, the PlayStation 2, was about to kick off one of the greatest eras in console gaming. Hardware, however, meant nothing without a lineup of launch titles to cement first impressions. And what a lineup it was. A not so new, but important tool for marketing were these demo discs showcasing already released and upcoming titles. Sony had a few demo brands already running, but the most prominent was the PlayStation Underground, Jam Packs. This is Extermination. Developed by Deep Space Interactive, Extermination was set to be the first survival horror title for the PlayStation 2, a genre already popularized by the dominating Resident Evil franchise, with smaller successes such as Dino Crisis and Parasite Eve. Oddities, misfits, and considerable failures included Overblood and Martian Gothic. It's safe to say that making a decent survival horror game wasn't the easiest during this time. Let alone standing beside giants like Dynasty Warriors and Final Fantasy, Extermination had quite a lot to live up to and compete against. On release, Extermination was given the proverbial shrug score, 7 out of 10s on average. Strangely enough, PlayStation Magazine rated it pretty low, lower than most. While not a failure, the game wasn't the stellar performing, groundbreaking monster it hoped to be. What about a cult classic? I, I wouldn't even give it that title. Much like Extermination's own environment, it has become one with the permafrost of that early PlayStation 2 transitional era. Thankfully, not only do I remember it, but I also have a flamethrower. mission for the Marine Special Forces Recon. Don't let your guard down. Follow your training and you'll make it back alive. Semper Fi! Go out there and show the world what Marines are made of. Yes, sir! Our mission code name is Cold Limit. Check the mission data on your wireless terminals. Yes, sir! It's December 24th, 2005. A distress signal has been sent three days prior from Fort Stewart, a top-secret United States military base in Antarctica. We're immediately introduced to the half-fictional United States Marine Corps Force Recon Team, codenamed Red Light. It's a mouthful, but at least they're trying with relative realism. Relative. If it is any relevancy in this video, I have minor knowledge of the real US Marine Corps. I was a devil dog. Not a door kicker by any means. I was a Pogue aircraft mechanic, but I'm most definitely aware of the OODA loop and behooving. <laughs> Marine Force Recon isn't really a thing. Recon, however, is. Say what you want about them, but they make for pretty great aircraft mechanics too. This man is Major Mike Madigan, leader of Team Red Light. He's highly motivating by shouting Semper Fi during his mission brief, which is being conducted on an active flight. That's strange, but this already lets you know how immediate the response is to the situation. After the brief, Sergeant Dennis Riley and Sergeant Roger Grigman share a somber moment. Dennis laments the loss of a shared friend, Andrew, from an undisclosed and never expanded upon previous operation in Cambodia. Silly nitpick here, but besides the clearly out of regs hairstyles, the first name basis that every Team Red Light member is on sounds pretty goofy. Then again, me and my goons were guilty of it once we ascended the NCO ladder. So far immersion is still there, and it all feels genuine and serious. 
Roger attempts to cheer him up, and the two toast their knives in remembrance of their fallen comrade. It's in Cambodia. You, me, and Andrew. When times are rough, I look at this and remember that I have good friends. We go way back. We're more than just a unit. Never forget that. Your pain is my pain. Thanks, Roger. Murphy's Law strikes and our C-17 is going down. Our platoon scatters on parachute. First impressions offer it. Good sound design, crisp but odd voice lines, lips out of sync, and so many questions begging an answer to, all from the initial cutscene. Our toes have barely been exposed to the bitter cold, but here's a warning. The game is good, it's cheap, it's short, if you're curious try it out, don't let it be spoiled here. From this point forward, we're getting into everything. Dennis here. This is Roger. Where are you? Look up. There's a ventilation shaft up here. It should lead into the compound. You need to get up here. Come on. This icy cliff looks impossible. You'll have to find a way around it. Just follow my directions. First, activate the elevator. Got it. On your feet, Marine. Frozen chosen round two. No button prompts are given, movements aren't explained, and the action button, X, is used for everything save for aiming and shooting. The movement feels responsive, but there's some jank at times. It's half the best you could ever hope for in the genre, and half blisteringly painful. Run speed is fast, making it easy to maneuver, but walking is nigh impossible, making the limited slow slash precise sections irritating. This pipe will be your first filter, and no one likes taking punishment damage for bad controls on the tutorial in a limited resource game of all things. At first I thought it was my third party fart controller, but even with the official DualShock 2, I have to slowly creep the stick forward, readjust my direction, and repeat. Sometimes I'm needing both hands to carefully nudge it, and even then it's a gamble between the sneak walk, normal walk, and half jog. There's climbing and jumping mechanics. The degree of verticality and how much it's used is very impressive. This makes you feel capable, as you should playing a high-speed marine. These actions are once again done by pressing X. One button for multiple actions and concept should seem streamlined, reducing fatigue on the player during stressful situations, but you can guess it's up to the game to decide whether or not you're jumping or climbing. Movement is your enemy in some cases. That is not a good thing. Another great note depending on how you feel about player handholding, there are no invisible barriers. The camera usually follows behind you, but with how free you are to move around, you'll sometimes fight against it. L1 will attempt to reset the camera for a better view, but I always found it easier to snap up your rifle since no matter what the camera wants you to see, aiming will always show your frontmost view. Some items are missable due to this, so constantly brandishing your gun will mitigate the headache the camera will give you. There's a dedicated melee button, circle. Holding it will create a large upward sweep. A light tap whips a quick strike or a three hit combo. Very practical for ammo conservation. One feature not discussed in the game is a dodge roll. Now the small amount of reviews I've seen this list this as an issue, because the dodge roll is actually one of the most useful actions in the game. Ah right there, the emulator goons eternally BTFO'd. It's in the manual. Remember manuals? This is one of the better ones, even go step by step on how to traverse this tutorial section. All marines have their green monsters on hand, and the best marines know the divorce rates and color coded alert system. This elevator requires a battery charge to power up. You carry with you a rechargeable battery, used frequently for doors in the save mechanic. Saving your game requires a computer terminal and two blocks of power, akin to Resident Evil's ink ribbon system. You'll find maps of the area frequently, and they're always in plain sight. Just a big blue drawing with no verticality or objects of interest. The exception is the big glowing dot that tells you where you need to go. Sometimes you have to flip through multiple maps to find this dot, but getting lost is difficult if you pay attention. And lastly, we're at where extermination sets itself apart and cements its legacy, the combat. More specifically, the number one tool you'll be using, the SPR-4. A true-to-life M4 variant, this weapon is given to you straight out the gate. There are two ways to aim. R1 red is your rifle with a helpful red laser sight, and R2 goes into first-person mode with a faint red dot that catches surfaces as you move. Going into your status menu and flicking over to the SPR-4 specific screen, you'll notice there's slots available for your upper receiver rail mount, trigger group, and two slots for your Picatinny handguard. The SPR-4 is a modular machine, which is perfect because there are no other firearms in the game. Only upgrades or attachments to improve your aim, navigate, or offer alternative ways to defend yourself. 
the Special Purpose Rifle TAC-4. Standard issue for Team Red Light. Its ability to be modified for any combat scenario makes it a perfect weapon of choice for elite operators. The fictional portrayal of this rifle is unbelievably realistic. Based off the SOP Mod 1 program for the United States military in the late 90s through 2000s, extermination was clearly inspired. The modularity of an AR-M4 platform meant one gun could be so much more. Instead of an inventory full of multiple rifles, pistols, shotguns, the SPR-4 was instead a workhorse backed by both real and semi-fictional attachments to fit the niche of your standard armaments. Your initial SPR-4 loadout is a red dot optic and a flashlight laser grip combo. This foregrip setup eludes me. I searched high and low for a similar real world equivalent and came up empty on all fronts. What I have here with me is my own custom job. Not the prettiest by any means and far from actually practical, it's still serviceable for this presentation. It's a simple Swede style foregrip Streamlight light laser and flashlight combo, all JB welded in a cut up cheap toolbox. Thank you, Master Force. The laser is activated by holding R1. You remain in third person, locked into place but with a nearly infinite XYZ direction. When your laser meets a target, you lock on with pinpoint accuracy and you're able to fire indefinitely until you're forced to move or your target is eliminated. Now, some enemies have a weak point. Without getting too much into it yet, the lock on isn't always the best choice for combat. While R1 is held, your secondary fire button, circle, will activate the flashlight. The flashlight can sometimes light up the whole room or provide no real illumination at all. Very situational, but when it's really needed, it does its job. The singular gripe of the SPR-4 is not the rifle itself, but reloading it. There are no tactical reloads. Either waste ammo to throw in a fresh mag or risk having to reload mid-combat, which isn't fun in tight quarters. So you might ask yourself, is this just a realistic looking M4 with fantasy attachments? Well, let's look at the red dot. It's based off the Trijicon RX-01 reflex sight, which is also called an ACOG. This piece right here is where I deemed it fake until I saw the famous SOP mod picture. Well, there it is. This specific reflex sight is called the RX-01 NSN, where a polarizing filter is installed in front of the unit. The purpose of this filter is to dim the amber colored dot in high light exposure. Due to the tritium's light absorbing capability, an RX-01 is susceptible to blurring or an oversized dot picture. The ultimate issue here would be inaccuracy. The RX-01 was one of the first larger scale adoptions of red dot sights, with its competitor being Aimpoint, an already proven piece of gear in the field. Nowadays the RX-01 is trumped in both military and civilian use by many brands, and Trijicon has since then discontinued manufacturing them. It's a collector's item for sure, and what a hassle it was obtaining one. eBay was kind of a bust here. I paid $500 for the first one I saw on there, and upon arrival I noticed the phallus shaped artifact in my lens, and that wasn't listed in the description. Thankfully, I sent it into Trijicon, and they fixed my broken glass for free, so there's hope for you too if you run into online auction tomfoolery. Thinking I would get some more things done before it came back, I bought another, and another, and one more for giggles. Now this lens was another big conundrum. Trijicon's official name for it is the RX-20 Polarizing Lens. What a journey it was to find this one. I'm talking calling random gun and surplus stores across the country because the entire internet was awash. eBay, however, saved the day after a few weeks of waiting patiently. And what a save too, because this thing does its job as advertised. It gives me a cleaner dot and variable light, and it's easily adjustable. Some say it's too adjustable, and that it moves after a few shots, it works on my machine like a dream. Shout out to whoever finds that RX-20 on the website that's in stock for cheap, and thinks I'm dumb. This wasn't the only lens attachment I used. The Tenebrakes? Tenebrakes? The Tenebrakes? Uh, the Kill Flash Honeycomb shades your view in the sight slightly for the benefit of scope glare being reduced. Now I'm not sure how well exactly. No one has pointed my own rifle at me, nor have I been in firefights lately and died because the 24mm lens reflected like a COD scope. But it completes the look just as well, and there is a practical use for it at least. If you can't find an RX-01 because some goober bought all of them, you can get away with an RX-30. It's the predecessor to the RX-01, and it's twice the size. It's still pretty expensive and rare though. The red dot offers a zoomed in view of your front sight post, with a blurry red dot that moves with object collision instead of just being a dot in the center of your screen. Sadly using the red dot, it doesn't actually take you into the real sight picture of the RX-01. You're offered two firing modes single shot and burst fire. You're automatically using single, but with the burst fire, it can be adjusted to single or two round burst with your thumb. Spare magazines are tracked and retained throughout the game. You start off with two, and there's plenty more mags to find as you progress. 
If you choose a clear the room approach, watch your ammo. It's easy to burn your starting surplus, and wasted shots can not haunt you. So that's your standard SPR4 loadout for the time being. It's pretty interesting, there's multiple tools offered early on. You're capable, as you should be. No choice but to jump this one. This the ventilation shaft? Meeting up with Roger after an impressive jump explains the timing of the ventilation fan and how it's their way inside. You sure this is the right way? Trust me! about this place? No. This place looks like a battlefield. What the hell? This looks bad. Just doesn't feel right. Your instincts are still sharp, huh? It's kept me alive so far. Let's look around. There may be some survivors, including Cindy. Let's check out what we can. We'll start here. Cover me. <clears throat> no one here. I'll take a look around. You check out the corridor. Okay. The interior of Fort Stewart offers no more comfort than outside. There's a sick feeling that you missed the carnage by just a moment. Be sure to bash every crate you see, as items and memos are hidden inside. Watch out for fire. It's a barrier first, and damaging annoyance second, so don't think you can push past it. Roger suggests we explore for clues, and a way to ground facility building B. In trimming some backtracking here, we find out that a drawbridge separates the two main buildings of Fort Stewart. We're tasked with restoring power to the A side. This door leads us into a massive interior train garage. A creature scurries away as we head inside. Roger and Dennis joke about who always heads first into danger with a sprinkle of backstory. Their Cambodia op, which took the life of Andrew, almost claimed Dennis's had it not been for Roger. He sends us off with a promise he'll buy us a beer once we accomplish this mission. Okay, when we get back, I'll buy you a drink. Here's our first encounter with a creature. This one doesn't seem to move too much. Dies in three shots or one heavy slash from your knife. Hydras, as they're called, are the most common enemy. Usually appearing in packs, it's easy to get swarmed or snuck up on. They have two attacks. One is to fly up and latch onto you, and more than one can do this at a time. Wiggle the sticks until you peel them off, but if unsuccessful, you'll take damage and an increase of your infection percentage. The second attack is a green ball of slime they spit, which causes worrying infection damage. We'll get into what infection can do later. If these mutilated corpses are any indication, we can assume the worst. You can hear the Hydra's horrific squeals and fleshy movements, and you know the coast is clear once those noises stop. You probably already picked up a few healing items by now. Save all the Bs you find, only rely on healing A's for the most part. Booster shots should be left untouched, unless you're far from a vital medical treatment we'll see later on. This garage has a slew of items to find. Memos provide some info on an outbreak regarding bugs, and more frightening, the effects of infection. You'll also learn that crates not only contain items, but enemies. No matter how many times you'll play, this will always catch you off guard. Containers of green lights, this button does too. A sliding device for train maintenance. I should be able to jump from the carriage to the container. We learned that we can interact with green buttons. Green is good. Let's get the power going.
Way to go, Dennis. Now we can get to the rendezvous point. Time to head back. Some Hydras may respawn, so beware. You can go back in, but it's pointless. As we head down to Roger, you can hear rapid gunfire. If the gunfire sounds closer, it's an automated turret locked onto a Hydra. The turret has no discretion. You can shoot it to stun it for a few seconds, but that won't shut it down. The only way to keep them dead is to cut the power cord that dangles in front of them. Roger! Uh, well, oh, Dennis! Help me! Dennis! Roger! Get out of the way! Don't move. I had no choice. I'm with the... Special Marine Forces Recon, I know. You're here to scout the facility, but you're too late. Things are already out of control here. Please listen to what I'm telling you. Get out of here as soon as you can. Tell me, what the hell happened here? What happened to my partner? Wrong place at the wrong time. It wouldn't help even if I told you. Just leave here. This area will be taken over any moment now. Taken by who? Take this! Use it. If you don't want to end up like your friend, the antibodies will temporarily ward off infection. Infection? You'll find the survivors and your friends in Ground Facility Building B. Get to them as soon as you can and go back home! Even a brave Marine needs to know when to run. Hey! Wait! Who are you? What happened here? Tell me! Damn it! Roger. I can't believe this. Our whole world has collapsed, and our first real taste of the horror comes with the death of Dennis's best friend. The hazmat-suited woman urges us to leave and barely gives us any info on the extent of the situation. Though cold as she was, she gifts us an SPR4 magazine and an MTS vaccine. We still have our objective, and while losing Roger is an unfathomable blow, we have to press onward at Building B. The CG cutscene is where you may tilt your head. It's in this weird black and white or some sort of color correction, all until the end where Roger's chest explodes. These colors are vibrant and gory, but why not the rest of the video? This is an issue of PAL vs NTSC copies of the game. The non-stateside release has a slew of changes from outfits, voices, and lines. Uh, first you send me through the fan, and now I gotta find the train uh, steam room. Right. Right. Anyway. Who saved your sorry ass in China? If I hadn't been there... I would have been chop suey, right? Yada, yada, yada. I've heard it all before. For some reason, this cutscene's in full color, but we were gimped on the stateside release. The follow up in game cutscene is what can really sell the tone. The music is one of the best tracks ever in terms of atmosphere. The voice acting is at its most believable, and the motion capture and timing is just art. The way the woman tosses the magazine, Dennis sees it, and intercepts her before she has a chance to reload are just amazing small touches. It's not hammy, and while it's easy to say that Dennis didn't react strongly enough, it's because his character requires him to be perseverant. 10 out of 10. Good drama, good show. The 
drawbridge went back up. I can't go back there anymore. The drawbridge went back up. If you chose to take out all the hydras up to this point, you're probably out of ammo. Run into the supply room, or what I'll always remember it as, the second comfiest place on planet Earth. Safe computer, battery charger, and our first introduction to the MTS bed. A fictional hyper-sophisticated machine that's supposedly a cure-all autodoc. Quite impressive, and it adds to the mystery of what really goes on here. Uses one MTS vaccine vial and restores all health and removes all infection percentage. Infection is a feature where when your infection percentage reaches 100, your back grows a glowing core, your health is reduced significantly, and you're on a timer to reach the nearest MTS bed and cure yourself. Your health gradually decreases, and no amount of healing items will keep you alive. This can happen very quickly if you're overwhelmed, and reaching an MTS bed may be impossible, so this state can sometimes mean certain death. The MTS vaccine shouldn't be the last ditch it's made out to be. They're still scarce, but they're a better alternative than using healing items. Save the on-the-go stuff for when you can't reach one of these beds. Don't waste them on trivial damage. This room gives us another first, the ammo storage unit. Fills ammo to max capacity, and it has unlimited uses. It makes sense, this is, or was, a functioning military base. Of course they have logistics like this at the ready. Restock and heal up, it's back into the fray. This section teaches us two things. Explore before you press buttons, and objects and cutscenes are closer than they appear. You have more freedom to take out the hydras with the supply room nearby, and enemies don't respawn here, so take your time and backtrack if needed. When you're ready, Press that green button. If you dodge successfully, a new area opens up and it's flooded with more hydras. Charge up this door. Hey, wait a second. Isn't that... The hazmat woman can be seen on the other side of this door, but before we can get to there, let's explore and take out some hydras. This room can easily overwhelm with the amount of enemies, so utilize your dodge in about phases. Standing in one spot for too long, you will get punished. If you're savvy, you'll notice this bar above the entrance that leads to this cage. This mound of fleshy goo stops you short of your target, which lets you know there's no real trickery to exploration. When you secure the cargo area, head to the security door. Damn, it's locked. Hey, you're that girl from before. I'm trying to get to building B. How do I get there? You're still here? Use the elevator. Elevator? What elevator? You can reach the ground facility by using that freight elevator. How do I activate it? What's this? It's the security code to unlock this door. Type it into the command center's computer. Then what? I'll give you what you need to operate the elevator. Get to the ground level, find your friends, and get out of here. Hey! Damn! Good old pen and paper mentality. This code won't be saved in your memos, so keep it handy. 
You'll most likely hear It's a security code several times before getting it down. It's a security code. The music in this section is totally strange and eventually grating, and the objective isn't more dire than most, it's just annoying after a while. It's a security code. It's a security code. This section will make you dislike the fresh track start, post menu, or door. If you haven't yet, here's an opportunity to try out exploding barrels. Careful, as shooting them can send nearby barrels flying in RNG patterns. That includes within your range. The dark room. Pitch black, unless you're butted against an object in this little maze-like corridor, you'll stick yourself in a corner fast. Use your tack light for either quick illumination or fight off a heavy amount of hydras. There's a ladder that leads us to not much unless you have a key. You guessed it, we'll probably have to come back here at some point. Roger. Damn it! How could this happen? The command center is stress incarnate. Visually, it's one of the most interesting areas. It has good lighting, a chaotic layout, and a crash course on environmental hazards. This place is infested with hydras as expected, but let's try to get out of dodge. Jump up here and we got some monkey bar action. Need to take aim? You can support yourself with a harness and have free reign to shoot while suspended. I am become Verticality, Destroyer of Heights. If you fall down here, there's an electrified floor, which combined with the music, it'll test your patience. Avoid this floor until you finish your objective here, but if you fall down, try to make it to this box. This is where the movement sensitivity really hurts, and the way the game judges your jumping distance, it's all just a horrible mess. You will take damage on this floor. If you find yourself using more than one healing type A, give up, it's not worth a headache. Time these live wires right, and finally make it inside the center of the command center. Type in the code. Type in the code. Mm, there we go. And rest your ears. The normal music is back, and it's pretty good. What happened to Roger? Uh, oh yeah, quick note. Destructible boxes respawn, but the items inside don't. There's no harm in rechecking the boxes, but it's a waste of time otherwise. With the lockdown clear, the door is open. Time for some answers. So, you got out okay. It was you, Cindy? I've been worried about you. I haven't been able to contact you ever since that day. Dennis, is it really just a coincidence that you're here? Regardless, I don't have anything left to say to you. Just leave me alone. I knew you were here before I came. I was concerned for your safety. Don't you realize what you did? I'm telling you, I have nothing more to say. Cindy, this is no time to fight. Let's talk about that later. What on earth happened to this place? What's going on down here? Why did the military send your team in instead of just bombing this place? Don't they know what's going on here? Even brave soldiers like you won't be able to get this situation under control. The Pentagon misjudged this one. How do these monsters fit in? This could be the beginning of the end of the world as we know it. The worst scenario that mankind has ever faced just began. There will be no future for us if we don't act. Hurry up and get to ground facility building B. Go back home with your friends and tell your military that their dirty little plan has become a nightmare. This facility needs to be completely wiped out. What about you? I still have something to finish here. Let me give you this. Use it to activate the underground storage elevator. The elevator will take you to ground level. 
Now go. If you want to find the rest of your team. Dennis. About Roger. I'm sorry. I... I know. It doesn't seem real. Cindy, I'll wait for you to make it safely back to Building B. It's Cindy Chen, the former lover of the late Andrew. She transferred to Fort Stewart to isolate herself. She blames Dennis for Andrew's death and has nothing but contempt for him. Her role at Fort Stewart is never really established, but she seems to only know the outbreak and its results, as any other survivor would. She urges us to get to Ground Facility Building B once more, and offers little else in terms of assistance. We're on our own again, but the freight elevator is now operational, one step closer to the rendezvous point. But before we leave, a zoom scope can be found to replace your red dot if you wish. And if you picked up a memo back in the train garage, you might have read something about shotguns that were recently shipped to the fort. Here it is in all its glory, a 12 gauge master key. Attaching to your lower URS, this thing tips the scales considerably in your favor. Its downside is the ammo is scarce and it can't be reloaded from the supply boxes. Which is fair, the master key is incredibly powerful. The master key is a real world firearm. It's a Remington 870 cut considerably down and it's mounted either by rails or barrel D-ring clamped. The idea was to replace carrying a full-size shotgun, cutting down on overall equipment needed, and increased readiness. Its uses, however, were limited to door breaching and special shells, not necessarily suited for firefights. It ended up being too cumbersome, and full-size shotguns were still preferred. My father was even issued one. He used the age-old try-everything-twice method, once on his rifle, and the other just standalone. Yeah, even without a grip. and he quickly chucked it and returned to Ithaca M37 tradition. It's what we like to call based. This working abomination is a full-sized, legal-length Mossberg 500, attached by rails at the receiver, then an airsoft M203 mount cobbled together to support the barrel. The rails worked fine. The mount was a catastrophic failure. The pump grip is a cheaper than dirt special, but with how thin the plastic is and the rails not feeling the slightest bit beefy, probably would be better off with a normal pump in practice. It's heavy, definitely heavier than a real master key, and the non-SPS nature means this thing sticks out in the worst of ways. But why would a non-short barreled variant exist in a game? Here's my theory. Japan has very strict firearms laws, but boy do they love airsoft. I think they got away with some of the fantastic motion capture due to having airsoft replicas around. And just funnily enough, some developer had the same brainwave as me. Just stick whatever we have on the M4. My secondary theory is that the grip is not a standard master key component, but notice how animations are no different with the flashlight grip installed. Probably would have been goofy to keep the same animation with the lower attachment that didn't fit the hands just right. The good news is, this allows for a legal, no stamp required recreation of the SPR4. How it shoots though is something to be desired. Hit fire only, dealing with a lot of weight and a very awkward hole to cycle it. I put about 20 rounds of Wolf Double Lock Buck through it, and while not the torture test one would be satisfied with, it works fine. It's a Mossberg, she'll chew up and spit out whatever you feed her. The zoom scope, on the other hand, is a tough one to identify. To me, it looks like an aim point, but that's a non magnified red dot sight. Let's check our favorite infographic. No zoom scope like we see in the game, but we do have our aim point comp M2. It's safe to say that the zoom scope just uses the shape of the comp 2, and the need for a tactical looking optic in favor of a hunting rifle tier scope was the preferred fix. An LVPO would have fixed this gap, but these weren't as mainstream during the development cycle, and they still don't seem as high speed aesthetically. The zoom scope is your most useful optic. There is no downside to keeping this on your rifle, save for some peripheral loss. This combo will be two out of the three main attachments you'll be using. First boss fight. Keep your distance right away. He won't follow you if you go too far, but he'll be invincible, so no cheesing this one. Take out the Hydras first using your rifle, don't waste shotgun ammo. 
When you think you can handle the beast, face your fears and head up back the conveyor belt. The creature has devastating melee attacks, big swings and a charge that's readable, but will connect if you're not quick enough. It can also spew slime that'll stun and infect you. The space is very cramped, so watch your walls. Offload a burst and hit it with your master key when it gets close. Be warned, mag dumping isn't viable. The thing has a few frames of invincibility. Manual aiming is also advised against, as its weak spot, the glowing core, is really difficult to hit. Dodge rolling will save you. Consider this your tutorial for its effectiveness. Grab the dog tag from the blood puddle and heal up. Up the elevator we go. What the hell? Excellent! A perfect shot of our hero who destroyed the monster. <laughs> You're from Special Forces, right? You came to destroy this facility. <laughs> I'm Travis Miller, freelance journalist. Uh, I've been investigating this facility for five years. Something suspicious about this place. I finally managed to sneak in, and all of a sudden, I I'm in a horror movie. What the hell happened here? Answer me. They didn't tell you anything? There was an accident here. A big one. An accident? What kind? They lost control of something they were researching here. Probably some bioweapon. I'm going to ground facility building B. How do I get there from here? Oh, oh, that's where your friends are, huh? This could be another chance for a big scoop. Are you gonna tell me or not? Hey, take it easy. Go out into the snow field and look for the bright lights. They look like stadium lights. You can't miss them. The building under the light without an awning is building B. But find the control room first. And you also might want to hang on to this. Now, if you don't mind, I'll keep looking around. I'm going to get the story of the century here. Another survivor, Travis Miller, the undercover reporter. He tells us a more detailed way to get to Building B, and then scurries off for more of his big scoop. Odd encounter, and Dennis kind of roughed him up a bit, but we haven't met the friendliest bunch here at Fort Stewart. Outside went from inhospitable to deadly, as the freezing cold will chip away at your health until you find shelter. Go around this corner and head inside. An arctic parka saves us from chip damage, and we get a crowbar for progression. Down here are a few items, and the first we see the flesh wall. You can cut it with your knife, but I suggest you take the ventilation route. Last find in here is a door that requires another keycard to open. Keep this one in mind. Back outside, we head up the ladder. On this tower, we find a corpse. Getting the dog tag reveals his name, Lieutenant Matt Stugart. Interacting with the lieutenant shows that he was mortally wounded and prepared a makeshift bomb. Dennis reads his name aloud. First Lieutenant Matt Shugart? Matt Shugart. Activate the bomb and run like hell. The tower falls and breaks the fence to the remainder of the snowfield. You're almost guaranteed to take damage from falling debris, but if you're lucky, or you save scum, you'll find a safe spot. They lock the doors too, which is pretty cheap. Head back up the ladder and the roof opens up to reveal some items, but our objective lies beyond the tower. That didn't sound too good. No it didn't. There's something out there. 
Two creatures dubbed Predators lurk near the snow truck. This is a fight you don't want to take. Evade them, evade them, while you run for items. They can't follow you back to the tower or up the stairs, so don't worry. Two very important pieces of gear can be found. One in the snow truck, the missile launcher component A, and the other near the fallen tower, the flamethrower. The missile launcher component A is unusable, so we'll have to see what else we need to put it together. The URS Flamethrower, a fictional underbarrel attachment which pays homage to the greatest horror film ever made, John Carpenter's The Thing. Shoots a short range stream of fire that covers your enemy hole. Effective mostly on smaller enemies where shotgun ammo shouldn't be used. So no, this particular model doesn't exist and underslung flamethrowers are definitely a Hollywood or video game entity, but yard improvement methods have stagnated these last few years and the lawnmower man has a new best friend. Enter the Pulsefire UBF, or Underbarrel Flamethrower. Conceptually radical, conventionally silly, but 100% fun. This is a goofy range toy before any other application, but don't take that as an insult. I'm sure you can clear some brush or do whatever else it suggests on the box, but it's supposed to be mounted on your rifle, and waving a flame spouting AR around in your front yard may cause someone to be very jealous and call the HOA. They make other less conspicuous models for practical reasons, but that's getting off the point. Plug in your airsoft-ish lipo battery, fill the tank with gas, open this valve, flip the switch, and fire with this button. Pretty simple operation. Spits a good 15 to 20 feet, but looking back at the footage, the gas vapors far exceed the range, so you could just be dumping raw gas all over the place, and I wouldn't light a dart anywhere near this thing. The box has 20 seconds for operation on one tank of gas, and these short bursts stretch that out to about a minute or so. It dribbles flames, and as you can see, we're lighting up the ground as the flame extends. Huge safety hazard all around, but I wouldn't classify the pulse fire as an unnecessarily dangerous piece. It's a flamethrower. Pretty much all OSHA practice goes out the window post unboxing. So, this is the water filtration plant. The real horror of Fort Stewart is the architecture. The water filtration plant is the game's largest maze. For first timers, this place will confuse you as its nonsensical layout and sensitive movement inputs are almost unforgivable. The first stretch is the worst. Hydras, tripwires, and some really bad platforming, with some additions to the monster roster. Immediately you'll hear the squeaks of the infected bats. Creatures that take one or two hits before swinging at a lock-on. It's hard for them to damage you on their own, but if two come your way, you're in for a hassle. Did you see that? Did that really just happen? Standing still can now be deadly. Watch out for puddles of water. Whatever is causing the infestation really likes to manipulate the water. It springs up from the ground, gradually turning clear to green, and it can infect you pretty quick. In a rare case, you'll see this worm-like creature pop out of the water and lurch forward towards you. You'll never open the floodgate. Reach this platform and take out the behemoth. He can't reach you though, so now would be a good time to use your first person mode of choice to target its weak spot. Who are you? Sergeant Dennis Riley. U.S. Marine Special Forces Recon. Is that so? So the Pentagon sends in the Marines instead of the Army. I see. I'm Carl Morris. <laughs> the commanding officer of Fort Stewart. Well, on paper anyway. What the hell was that thing? 
What's going on in this facility? Didn't they tell you anything? <laughs> tell me what the hell's happened here. Look, I'm just a liaison with the boys back home. I don't know any details about the research. Research? On what? <coughs> a man named Falcon has full control over the project. He's the one who's really in charge of this research facility. Falcon? The only thing I know is there's something special about some of the water in this place. Of course, you can't tell just by looking at it. What do you mean? Some of that water was spread over the facility. It's too late now. I'm dead. This is the place where the end of mankind begins. Hey, hang on. Tell me about the water. Damn. The chief security officer dies before any real answers are given, but strongly urges us to avoid water and prevent water from reaching the creatures. It's a water filtration plant, and the creatures seem sentient enough to open the floodgates. Our enemy is growing stronger. Drain the water, and that door from the first area will open. The water's draining. Now I can get the building B. I hate this place. This mini garage here is another close quarters gauntlet. There's two humanoids lurking in the back, and sometimes you can draw them out by reaching this door. If not, activate the sprinkler system and try to get up to this platform. You're safe from the beast, but the hydras can still nab you. Take out what you can if you have the ammo, and I strongly suggest taking out the big guys. Cheesing it this way will likely give them the time to mutate in a puddle, but all that's going to do is cost you more ammo. If you have it, it's fine. Use the barrels to your advantage. Once the coast is clear, head under the snow truck and down the ladder. Now here's a reminder, this will probably be the longest you haven't saved, and missing this gap will set you back a good 20 minutes. Maybe more. It's very easy to fall here because the camera fails to do its job. Happens to me every playthrough. Time for some precise climbing. If you can't reach the railing, the game won't let you jump, so don't fear falling. Skin of my teeth, I refuse to use a single healing item. Can, can you imagine? I hate the water filtration plant. Phileo, it's Dennis. Sorry, Sergeant Riley. Where are the others? I'll show you. Riley! I was concerned when we lost contact with you. I thought this mission would be a walk in the park for a guy like you. But when you failed to make the rendezvous point, I feared for the worst. You alone? Roger was with me, but one of those things got him. They got Roger? He was a true warrior. And a good man. Yes, sir. We're launching a cleanup operation of this compound. It's payback time for Roger. Did you find out anything new about this place? Yes. There's some connection between the water and those monsters. The water, you say? We'll have to investigate that. Based on our report, the Pentagon decided to dispose of this facility. We're bombing the place? According to our files, there are several detonators throughout the compound. It was designed as a security measure in case the research material leaked out. Once they've all been armed, they will detonate on a timed countdown. But there are two complications. First, remote activation is impossible. All detonators must be armed manually. Second, the areas containing detonators are spread out across the compound, and they're blocked off. I sent out the rest of the team to investigate, but they're having problems. Where are the detonators located? They're in all of the underground research labs. There's also one in the power reactor. We're on our way there now. 
Come with us. Bilal has been waiting for a chance to see how good you are. Get ready to move out immediately. There's a helicopter waiting on the roof of this building. We'll go on up. Come as soon as you're ready. Let's go. Major, what about the survivors? We have to save them before we blast this place. Our primary objective is to destroy this facility. We'll worry about survivors later. Cindy. Reunited with the survivors of Team Red Light at last, our platoon commander, Major Madigan, informs us all plans have been scrapped in terms of rescue and recovery in favor of outright destruction of Fort Stewart. Several detonators are located around the compound, and that's what we'll be tracking down. Before that, we have to head to the roof. It's going for the water tank! Take it down! Yes, sir! Eagles Crow, red light team, do you read me? Repeat, this is Eagles Crow. Damn, I've lost contact with the advance team. Riley, you stay here and assist the men who are searching for the detonators. We've lost contact with all of them. Yes, sir. Here, take this with you. It's a dog tag receiver. Each team member has a dog tag that also acts as a homing device. Use the receiver to track their positions. I'll see you later. All right, Bilal, let's go. Yes, sir. More bad news from the Major. He gives us the dog tag receiver and heads off to the power reactor with Corporal Fallel. We're on our own again, but hopefully we can rescue our fellow Marines. Back at the bar, we have Sonia and Cindy. Hey there, soldier. Were you left behind? You are. Sonia Leone, systems engineer. Do you know anything about the detonation system? Yeah, a little. The detonators were placed in each research lab, but the labs were sealed off when the emergency security system kicked in. You need the metal tags that your friends took to get in. Metal tags? Cindy, you're all right. I'm still alive, thanks. You're not dead yet either. Stay here. Once we finish arming the detonators, we'll leave together. Didn't I ask you to leave me alone? You just show up here like this. How can I forget about the past with you around? Please, let me forget. I don't care if you despise me. But on that day, Andrew sacrificed his life to save mine. Now I've sworn to protect yours no matter what happens. I have to. For you and for Andrew. Oh yeah, if you find the metal tags, call me on the radio. I'm on channel 8780. I'll open the areas that contain detonators by computer. I don't think your team has worked it out, but the security codes can be input from here as well. Okay, let's synchronize our signals to this channel. Thanks, Sonia. Wait, here's the key to the snow truck in the parking garage. Take it. There should be something useful in the back. Okay. You staying here? We're heading to the infirmary soon. We can do more from there. That's where most of the computer equipment is located. I'll be able to help you from there. I appreciate all your help. I'll see you later, Cindy. I've got to get back to my team. I hope they're okay. So that's him, huh? I know what you must be feeling. But trying so hard to forget the past is just going to make things worse. What are you talking about? As long as you're trying to forget, you won't be forgetting at all. You don't have to forget. You don't even have to forgive. Instead, try putting yourself in his shoes and accept the situation. You'll feel a lot better. It must be hard for him, too. I'm tired. 
Sonya is more helpful by giving us a key to the snow truck, while Cindy still resents us. You'll get a radio call from PFC Taylor, pleading for assistance. This is Dennis. What's going on? Sergeant Riley, this is Taylor. We need help now. I'm with survivors, but we're surrounded by the creatures. Taylor, where are you? We're in Taylor Island, learning that it leads to the research labs. See the door in the water filtration plant. Taylor! Taylor! From the sounds of it, it's pretty dire. Though time is of the essence, you don't really have to rush anything. Head back to the roof to check for any items you may have missed, resupply from the infirmary, and check back at the garage to use Sonya's key. You have to do this one. The behemoths respawn along with the hydras. Do the same thing as before. Run up the ladder, attach yourself to the ceiling, and plink away. The key Sonya gave us opens up the snow truck. There's a vital increase in battery power here as well as some good healing items. Before we head anywhere else, let's go back to the infirmary and resupply. Backtracking here will be necessary for survival. Get used to running back to the infirmary. These next sections will be pretty intense. I brushed over it, but what the Major gives us is very important. The dog tag receiver takes up your upper URS slot and adds a radar to the bottom left side of the screen while aiming. If dots appear, then there is a Marine's dog tags nearby for collection. I'm not sure if it's a bug, but sometimes enemies or scenery corpses register as dots. So if there's nothing there, or it's just an enemy, that's all there is. I don't have a dog tag receiver equivalent, leave a comment berating my fapped out power ladder expediter, he's trying his best. No, he doesn't have any pelican cases you can order, stop asking Gunny. When you're stocked up, head back to the water filtration plant via that manhole. The door will eat most of your battery, so it's your call if you wish to refill it and come back. The music right when you enter the underground tunnel is probably the wackiest track of the whole game. The opening sounds like a spooky Spongebob tune, and then turns to pretty unnerving strings, and then crescendos into the heaviest dun-dun I have ever heard. That's if you hear the whole song though, because this section has doors and lots of menus, so you'll be hearing again and again. This is a pretty good room. Very intense, very dangerous. We meet the latest threat, dogs. They're fast, squirrely, and follow the if there's one there's more rule. They spit, latch, and swipe at you, definitely capable and worthy foes. The shotgun makes quick work of them, but with how slow it is to reacquire, you have to stay nimble. We've seen pulsating flesh puddles before. They're harmless, but they'll slow down your movement. This giant scab will damage you, however. Knock out its blue core, which you have to aim slightly above the core, I don't know why. They take a lot of punishment through the puddle itself, but the core is the best way to go. It's not like they're gonna go anywhere. There are turrets in this room too, don't get overwhelmed. Jump on the turned over train and gain the high ground. Bait out these two if possible and repeat the process. Be warned the dogs can mutate, which by now we can all figure out that these creatures can interact with water. If you manage to catch the dogs before they react to you, it's almost sad. They just lay there like a good boy. Double crushes you when you hear their death squeal. This room leads us to two paths. Ignore the top right hallway for now. There's lots of enemies, lots of exploration. Cindy, it's Dennis. Did you find him? I found a special code. It's KM2523. Check it out. Hold on. It's the access code for the level 2 lab research area. There should be a restricted area towards the back of the level 2 labs. The detonator should be in there. I'll activate the quarantine elevator from here. Okay, that should take you there. I'll send data on the location to your wireless terminal. Thanks. Just one thing. The power on level 2 is very low. How low? It's pitch black in there. 
No problem. What is it? It's nothing. Get going. We were unable to save Taylor and the survivor he was with, but we do have a tag with the detonation code needed for the next section. Be sure to crawl through all the vents and check for goods. And here we can score the interceptor unit. This piece replaces your scope and protrudes over your upper handguard. Its function is to provide a more solid lock-on in first-person aiming. Like your standard red laser, the aim point is almost never on the core of an enemy, so not only is it fictional, it's also not that useful. As for any real equivalent I have, sorry, that's a negative. Points off on my end again. If you have an experimental targeting scope you'd like to send me, post the classified documentation in the War Thunder forum so I know you're serious, and your social security. Mop up the remaining enemies as you'll be passing through here again, and another strong suggestion to double back to the infirmary to restock. Once you're ready, head into the first of two security halls slash labs. This one is suffering from a blackout, so that means your grip light is making another appearance at the cost of your shotgun. There's two humanoids in here stomping around, so take them out quickly before they mutate. A save room is near the entrance, so if you're feeling too flustered, duck back in there to catch your breath. Get ready, this room sucks. Bats, boxes, hydras, oh my. There's also another new enemy that's on its own harmless, but they can spit out hydras indefinitely. High priority target. Clear this room before you press any buttons. Either in your panic or after the fight, you'll find a night vision scope. Would have been more helpful before all this, but that would kind of defeat the point of its utility, I guess. Do you hear that? Come on, it's me, Travis! Ugh, it's you again. How did you get here? I managed to slip through the doors when security was down. Then I got trapped here. Anyway, I came across some very hot info. A professional journalist has to have good instincts, you know. What did you find out? Okay, army man. I'll let you in on some top secret information way before it hits the press. Wait till you hear this. I'm a marine. Don't mix us up with the army. Okay, a rivalry thing, I gotcha. I've written down some key information. Hope it'll help you out. What are you gonna do? It's dangerous here. Hey, I can take care of myself. I've got my story. Why the hell would I want to stay here? I don't want to test my luck any more than I have to. I'll see you around, Sir Marine Sir. <laughs> <coughs> I'm actually a devil dog. Don't get us confused with Frogmen Punisher logos. Sure thing, 49% APR Mustang, sir. It's actually quarter night at Brewski's. What about the off-base bar? They never fixed the window that says poo tables. Charisma! It's our good time buddy, Travis. Don't know how he survived in there with the creature, but a friendly face is a friendly face. I glossed over this, but we just retrieved a night vision scope. Show me the AN slash PVS TAC 17 Alpha. The in-game scope is modeled after what looks like a PVS-14 monocular, but with a box in the middle. Again, it's likely modeled like this to maintain a sleeker aesthetic. Get ready to aim your hate. I don't own a night vision anything. The only time I'm gonna let this slip, this video is an expensive venture. Minus the five reflex sights, that's my fault. Though night vision is definitely on my to-do list for a disposable income, but not an optic. Too many times burned on cheaper purchases, that would amount to what it cost for something of real note. I say that with the Mystery Meat Amazon Rail, UTG, and PSA parts, but I digress. If you want the extermination night vision experience, it was only useful in this room, just like the one time you'd bust out the budget AGM scope, 
and get laughed at by your dad with a flashlight. Continue into the high voltage trap room. The ceiling is our way across, and the hydras can be ignored unless you're extra motivated. Quick room, nothing really a note. This room has more bats than a humanoid nearby. Take out the big targets first, then the hydras. They seem to infinitely respawn in here, or there's so many that I just can't find them all. Make sure you climb up this vent and out the ladder. Lots of good stuff down here, as well as our first hardcore explanation of what exactly is going on here. HO213 seems to be a bacteria strain that has sentience, adhesion to water, and it's violent in its desire to spread. Dr. Yan Falcon. Hmm. A man named Falcon has full control over the project. Head back up and arm the detonator. With one detonator down, we're clear to pull out. Make the trip all the way back to the infirmary. The good news is, the floor is no longer electrified, and any enemies you dealt with so far won't respawn, so the most you'll deal with is a Hydra or two. From the infirmary, make your way back down to the underground tunnel, then to the room with the branching paths again. That route we ignored earlier is now the way to go. Cut the lock, and welcome back to the beginning of the game. The cargo room is now a glorified hellscape. Before you jump down, take out yet another new monster, the Gunner. Formerly a security officer or marine, these creatures are massive and pack a punch with deadly claws or the worst kind of attack, a spray of 556. This is admittedly stupid and nonsensical. The Gunner can fire an infinite amount of ammo in short bursts and they'll eventually find you and hurt real bad. The key here is to keep your distance so it relies on its rifle and its core is visible at all times. Use your red dot or zoom scope to target it and stun lock it before it gets a chance to hit you. Shots anywhere else will just drain your ammo. There's also a lot of flesh turrets, scabs, and dogs to contend with. This platform is great for sniping, so take advantage. Once it's clear to jump down, take a look around. Gary, you okay? Hey, Dennis. <laughs> Are you kidding? This is nothing. Oh. Damn, my body doesn't want to move. It's not safe here. I'll give you a hand. Don't treat me like an invalid. What are you doing here anyway? Like, don't tell me you just got here. I heard about the detonators from the Major. Do you have a metal tag? Uh, hang on. Here's the code. YS4921, I think. Cindy, it's Dennis. Yes. I found one of the special codes. Can you analyze it? It's YS4921. Just a second. That's the access code for the level one lab research area. There's a restricted area in the back. The detonator's inside. The level one lab is in the back of the underground storage area. It's through the door you opened earlier. Thanks, Cindy. Dennis, I didn't tell you before, but you know that this infestation is caused by a bacteria strain called HO213. Check out Dr. Falcon's files in the Level 1 lab research area for more details. The only thing I know is that the bacteria strain is highly aggressive. It uses a certain medium to spread and grow. A certain medium? The water? Yeah. It broke out of a water tank on the roof. It moved around like it was alive. Then it froze solid. It should still be on the roof. Frozen? This might be an important clue. I hope so. If you find anything out, call me. Okay. Gary seems to be the sole survivor of the detonator teams. He claims he's good on his own. Considering he survived this long in the room, I guess we'll take his word for it. He gives us a metal tag similar to Taylor's, and this allows access to the second lab area back where we first met Cindy. The elevator takes us to a well-lit room with the same flavor of enemies as the other one, though more claustrophobic. It's easy to get trapped behind the tables and dressings, so be wary. There's a Delta Auto site hidden in a corner. It's a fictional scope that looks like something out of HK's wacky prototype vault. It's capable of tracking multiple targets at once, but only the closest one will receive fire until it's either killed or replaced with a closer one. 
Like the Interceptor, it replaces your scope and upper handguard. It's a lot slicker though, way better design. Don't worry, this will have a chance to shine. I don't have a Delta Auto Sight either. I have a French Bulldog though. Did you bite me? What are you doing? What are you doing? The corridor here doesn't have an electrified floor, but lots of hydras and turrets. The detonator room is more of a lab than the other, no big drill and bats. There's another H0213 file here by Falcon. The detonator is armed and we give Cindy confirmation over the radio. Dennis here. Dennis! Cindy, how many of these damn detonators do we have to arm? Are they still trying to arm the detonator in the power reactor? Hurry back to the infirmary. The power reactor, it's in danger of infestation. Major Madigan. We're surrounded and they don't even realize it. Just get back to the infirmary. It's up to us to save them. We're the only ones that can do anything. Where's Sonia? She went down to give you something, but she never came back. I don't think. No, I'll be right there. Keep your eyes open and stay where you are. Got it. The Major's fate is uncertain, as the reactor mission has now been jeopardized by increased infestation rates. The music changes to another high-stakes orchestra, and we double-time it back to the infirmary. Should be cake if we cleared out all the monsters. Sonia. I can't tell Cindy, no way. It would be too much for her right now. Sonia has been taken from us. Her sacrifice grants us a beta card. Extremely important. Cindy, what's going on at the power reactor? Dennis, take a look. I told you that HO213 spreads through water, right? Well. Water with high HO213 bacteria content is flowing into the power reactor's coolant supply for the reactor core. So? Remember what you said? The water that came out of the water tank, it moved, then froze instantly. Well, I made a hypothesis based on the remaining research data. Go on. The HO213's weakness is cold. So if we blow up the compound, it'll die naturally? Well, it's only a theory. But yes, it won't actually die. It would enter a state of cryogenic preservation. Damn it! Similarly, when heat is applied, some kind of chemical reaction occurs, speeding up its ability to multiply. What does that have to do with the power reactor? That's just it. Somehow, the temperature of the reactor core jumped to 10 times higher than usual. After detecting that, the central computer started pumping water to the reactor core to cool it down. Now the reactor core is at the optimal temperature to incubate the HO213. Damn. The Major is in trouble. What can we do? Sorry to interrupt you two, but I need to see the nurse. Gary! What have you been up to? Uh, nothing much. Cindy, can you take care of Gary? No problem. Gary, are you going to be okay? It hurts a little, but it's nothing a kiss from an angel wouldn't heal. Show me the wound. I'm heading to the power reactor. The Major's surrounded. I'm going too! You rest here and look after Cindy. You got it! See ya, Cindy. Oh yeah, the drawbridge is repaired. A train car in the underground tunnel area A must still operate. Find the key in a nearby room. Cindy informs us of the state of the power reactor. The water used to cool the reactor is being used by HO213 to grow exponentially. Either HO213 grows beyond control of conventional weaponry, or we see how a nuclear reactor handles loss of safe function. The situation has gone beyond worst case scenario. Dennis has to make his way to the Major to make sure the reactor is secured. Gary survives his way back to the infirmary and revels in Cindy's presence. Leaving the two behind, it's time for one brutal stretch. Our only way to the reactor requires a train. You guessed it, it's all the way back to where we started. I've been adamant on engaging targets, but we're going to change our tactics to strict double time. There's far too many enemies to handle. 
Take only necessary engagements, but there shouldn't be that many. If you collected all items from an area before, nothing will take its place, or at least in this backtracking section, so don't worry. The train compass room is completely overrun. Use your dodge and stay on the move. Exit out the door and head to the supply room. This place is untouched, a safe haven. Save here for sure. The drawbridge is extended again. Get moving. There's a platoon of gunners roaming around, as well as bats and hydras. It's hard to avoid damage here, just mitigate it the best you can. If you're really needing a heal, a safe scum might help you. There is that first save room next to the drawbridge controls, but you can go without it. Won't change much of this corridor run. If you've knocked out these turrets at the start, they're still dead, but there's a chance they'll stun the gunners if they're still alive. If you're happy with your performance, press on to the garage. This is visually one of the best horror pieces in the genre. Before you hop down, take out the scabs and hydras. These hydras are going to be more beefy, needing two or three more bursts of your rifle. There's also a few replicators here, so check the ceilings. Don't go onto this platform until you're done exploring. But when you're ready, The Executioner is the bane of little Splitlip's childhood. Several attacks that can be hard to gauge, even with a predictable pattern. The full floor swipe will almost always get you. Get too close to the core, and the noxious fumes will linger longer than you'd think. And the three hammer fists will lead you into a corner, and they'll almost always connect on that third strike. It's a slugfest. Fight dirty. We saw that McDonald fell to the beast, but even in death marines watch over their brothers. His M203 40mm grenade launcher will serve us well, but not yet. Save that for now. Instead, use your trusty shotgun to make quick work of that core. The RX-01 red dot here should make another appearance, as its wider field of view and quicker aim aids in blasting the core. If you choose to use the rifle or flamethrower only, you're ready for a long and painful fight. Why do you think I'm using a fart controller in the first place? This shotgun works so well, it almost feels like cheating. But don't feel too bad. The Executioner is a good, but way too long boss fight. Victory over the Executioner opens the security door that we now have a keycard for. Save, snag that key. Before the train ride of the reactor, and this may sound silly, but head all the way back to the supply room near the drawbridge. You're probably due for an MTS treatment, so don't stress too much about taking damage on the way back. Coming back to the train though, you should be pristine. The reactor is unforgiving. It's the longest stretch of gameplay without a save, and multiple instant death scenarios. The M203 is one of those things that needs no introduction. It's an underbarrel 40mm grenade launcher that's been a staple of United States military equipment for decades. The in-game variant is a standard rail-mounted deal, but with one ugly fault, this grip. Going back to the Master Key's pump, the reusable animations are likely the culprit. It fires one shell and needs to be reloaded, unlike the Master Key or Flamethrower. It also has one wicked arc with no good aiming apparatus, so play around on a fudge save before you use it. It deals plenty of damage and will knock out a gun or a humanoid in one hit. Mutated ones, however, might take two or sometimes three, but if you're burning your scarce 40 mic ammo on them, you might have bigger things to worry about. Here's mine, complete with the power of JB Weld. Okay, I'll say it, there's nothing more lame than pretending to own something you don't. A trained eye can see that this is an airsoft tube. Normally I'd be clowning on doing something like this, but I'm not running around like it's real. We'd have a problem then. I considered getting a 37mm launcher, which is legal without the funny stamps, but even then what would be the point? I could show off bird bombs or some super cool flares. Fort Hood changed its name to Fort Liberty, so I guess I can't just find a lost one buried near the gate anymore. I'm stuck LARPing for this one, another point against. The tube's stuck anyway.
let's fire up the train. Gather yourself, that was just a taste. It's hard to see, but there's a turret here. I don't think I've ever been hit by it, but why take the chance? Get the spike boots to scale the mountain face. Freeze! Valil, what happened? Sergeant Riley. Sorry. So hard to see. You've been shot. Who did this? The Major. What? I was... I... Valil! The Major? How can that be? The power reactor is above this icy cliff. If the Major is up there, I'll have to climb. Corporal Valil, apparently slain by the Major, there's not a lot of people here to begin with, and now we're getting an element of distrust. Could this be the reason why the reactor mission has gone awry? No time to think, it's time to climb. There's a missile here inside the cave, but its potential cost may turn someone off from retrieving it. Any slip off this mountain results in death. Bonus points for jumping off by accident. Keep climbing, and we'll meet up with the Major. Major! Riley, where are the others? Major! What is it? It's nothing, sir. The underground detonators are fully armed. The last one's in the power reactor. We tried to go straight in, but the infestation kept us from reaching the detonator. No one else made it out. I have some important information. The monster is actually a bacteria strain called HO213. It spreads through the water supply, reproducing faster with heat. The water is now concentrated right here in the reactor core. So that's it, eh? We're right in the middle of the infestation. It looks bad in there, like hell on Earth. Sir, they also seem to have a weakness. They are vulnerable to extremely low temperature. If we could lower the temperature of the reactor core, we should be able to stop them. Somewhere in the plant is an emergency coolant tank for the reactor core. We might be able to blow that up, but we'll need a powerful explosive if we only had some C4. We have explosives. Gary rigged up a custom job for this mission. It should be in the wreck of the C-17. Where's the plane? There's a waste disposal area just beyond here. The plane's balanced on the edge of a crevasse near there. I saw it from the helicopter earlier. Are the explosives intact? It was stored in a special container, so it should be fine. Okay, let's split up. One of us will get the explosives, the other will secure the entrance to the power reactor. Once that's done, we'll make our way down to the reactor with the explosives, attach it to the coolant tank, arm the main detonator, and evacuate. Yes, sir. You find the explosives while I deal with things here and secure the route to the rooftop. Riley, use this. It'll upgrade your base SPR-4. I'll attach it right now. We're counting on you, Riley. Dennis keeps the Phalel situation to himself and listens to his orders. Good thing, too, because the Major hands us a fully automatic trigger group for SPR-4. It's your choice to change it up from the burst, but the full auto one is just slow enough to grant consistent bursts just the same. As close as we can get without insane funds and silly stamps, the binary trigger can help us squeeze out a hair of increased rate of fire in a legal semi-automatic rifle. The Major tasks us to snag a special bomb inside the C-17 we came in on. The plane is close by, a little too close. Another few feet or so and it would have crashed into the reactor. Can't imagine where we'd be now if that was the case. 
As we approach, we can see two more predators lurking near the off-ramp. These ones are also confined to this area, so it may be best to just run past them. Before we get into the plane, there's a downhill slide where we can net some useful items. Only thing that sucks here is that we have to climb the mountain face again. Climb onto the C-17's ramp, and then we slide down into a warped up interior. This is the most cramped combat room in the game. The Hydras can be ignored, but this guy needs to be taken care of. It's very easy to drain your health here. Remember your last save was back at the garage. Kill the monsters, snag Ares bomb, This next part is plain annoying. Platforming on these dangling cargo crates is a rage-inducing endeavor. You see this little box here? That's a healthy amount of 40mm grenades. You will need these. Sometimes you'll get lucky and not take damage falling down, or you'll be like me. Head back outside, we can run past the predators and head for the elevator. Riley, you made it! Major, the explosives are intact. Getting to them wasn't as easy as I thought. I've activated the maintenance elevator that goes to the rooftop. You can descend into the power reactor using the crane on the roof. Once you've armed the explosives, get back to the rooftop fast. Yes, sir. Huh? Hey, you, you're... Roger? Roger? Major! Roger, over here! You told me to be strong. I believed in those words, but what matters most is that I believed in you. What I want to know is how come a tough guy like you let some bacteria eat him for lunch? Was that all a lie? Answer me, Roger! Dennis. The Major is gravely wounded, and we're on our own, fighting against our old best friend. If he was a strong guy before now, he reigns Monster Supreme. We can fight him from the platform, sniping his multiple cores and hammering him with a few grenades. Or we can get Cerebral Ballsy and fight him on the center platform. His attacks include a wild spray of gunfire, missiles, and if you're up close, heavy charges and nasty swipes with his giant blade. He deals crazy damage up close. But don't rush to the healing bees just yet. What's worse is the explosive barrels along the catwalk. Unavoidable damage. Clear the barrels beforehand if you have a chance. You can also fall off the ledges here, so be careful and hug that back wall. If you don't know the range of the 203, now is a bad time to learn. We have a healthy stock of grenades, but you're guaranteed to waste a couple. They do the best damage though, and if you're really panicked, there's no harm in using them. Roger. Rest in peace, old friend. Pick up both Roger's tags and his knife. Major. I'm fine. Get to the crane. You know what I did to Phil L? L let me explain. I, I, I want you to know why. Phil L was a CIA agent planted in our team to retrieve a sample of HO213. That can't be. Our mission was reconnaissance, but 
I was also given a secret objective. Our real objective was to completely annihilate the HO213, but certain factions within our government do not agree. And some high-ranking officials from the Pentagon felt that the bacteria must be retrieved at all costs. It is a serious threat. It could lead to the destruction of mankind. The HO213 has been on Earth for a very long time, but it's been lying dormant, an inheritance from the distant past. This inheritance has become the biggest secret our country has ever kept. Biggest secret? They sent an agent so that our country could monopolize this micro-apocalypse that could end all life on our world. So the plane was sabotaged? No one but Philel was supposed to come back from this mission. You, me, and the rest of the team were expendable. This team means as much to me as my own family. That's why I shot freaking Philel. <laughs> the explosives. I'll activate the detonator. Get over to the control panel and turn on the power for the crane. We're going in. Let's blow those bastards to hell. Dennis here. It's me. Riley, listen. Look at the control panel. That disc was the key to the area that contains the final detonator. Major. <laughs> Leave this to me. This is the perfect job for an old-timer like me. After all, looks like I was destined to die here anyway. Use this to slide down the power cable. You remember your harness training, don't you? Major! You must survive and escape from here. You inherit my legacy. You're now the leader of Team Red Light. That's a promotion, Dennis. Now go. Major. Lots of good exposition here. The Major was the true and honest Marine all along. The story works in a plot with government factions, all frothing at the mouth for their preferred outcome, regardless of the cost. This works, it's realistic. The Major leaves us with proof of this incident and its perpetrators, and then chooses an honorable death alongside his fallen men. He didn't even think twice to pop that fed traitor either. Major Mike Madigan is a true hero. Use the pulley harness and zip line down far away from the reactor. Cindy, there's something I wanted to tell you. What is it? It's about the accident. Andrew's accident. I, I was there when it happened, and I saw it wasn't Dennis's fault. The whole plan was flawed from the beginning. Dennis took it harder than anyone else. The fighting was so fierce that he couldn't even bring back Andrew's body. You know how much that means to us? They were like brothers. I mean, can you imagine what it's like to lose someone you know better than anyone else? And he couldn't even bring back his body. When Dennis told me that Andrew had been killed, I lost it. I said some terrible things to him. I just couldn't handle it. I knew there was no one to blame. But it took a year before I could pull myself together. 
I know I treated him badly. I wanted to call him, but I just couldn't. I didn't know what to say. I told myself I'd apologize the next time I saw him. But as soon as I saw his face here, it brought back all that old pain. You know, Dennis worries about you constantly. No, he never shows it. He's ready to trade his life for yours. <sighs> now, not only your future, but humanity's future rests in his hands. He's hurt, but he's a brave man. He'll do it alone if he has to. The least we can do is give him our support. Right? Dennis. We're back at the very beginning. The tutorial comes in full circle. Run it the exact way to the ventilation shaft. The fan spins for three seconds and stops for two seconds. But with the inertia, it's only clear for one second. Yes, but the price was too high. Cindy, I have a disk I want you to decode. Please get ready. I'll be back soon. Okay. This nightmare's taking over everything. Don't get too comfy. We're back in hell. Make your way back to the supply room ASAP. Save, restock, and head back to the infirmary. Cindy, decode this disc, quick. What is it? I'll explain later, hurry. Project name, extermination. Extermination? Annihilation, extinction, <laughs> such an ominous mission name. The last detonator is in the maximum security area. Now this puzzle is finally coming together. Everything that happened here was part of an experiment. So what are we? Guinea pigs in an infestation experiment? Unbelievable! Bastards! Only thing to do is to wipe this place out completely. I have to go out there and arm the detonators. Where's the maximum security area? It's through the command center. I'll send data on the location to your wireless terminal. All right, have to hurry. Dennis. If we ever make it out of here, I have something I need to tell you. Hold that thought. It will give me a reason to survive. The mission was doomed from the start. The accident turned into an opportunity for various government goons, and now a complete scuttling of all traces of Fort Stewart is all anyone can agree on. Wait, do they account for the possibility of the frickin' C-17 crash landing into the reactor? The survivors were always expendable. Gary, Cindy, and Dennis are all that's left. One last mission before we start escaping. One detonator remains. It's located within the maximum security lab near the command center. And judging by how horrible these early areas have been decayed, we can bet the command center is a nightmare. But before we knock out the last detonator, there's some secrets to explore. Stock up. This is the last time we'll be seeing the Tun Tavern. Head back to the roof and shimmy your way up this platform. Glide across the zip line and get some goodies. Head back to the water filtration plant, and it's another one of those zip lines. Inside we get some ammo and a crazy attachment. A six shot underslung grenade launcher. This will come in handy. Drop down and we're back at the start of the plant. Never change, water filtration plant. Never change. Head back through the snowfield towards the room where we found the parka. Our destination is in the boiler room, the beta card door. The predators will still be roaming around. It's up to you how you want to handle them. Inside the security door, we get a battery upgrade up to 24 cells and the missile launcher component B. Still can't piece her together, but we're one step closer. We're also near the command center without having to run through the underground tunnel. Take the freight elevator to the cargo room and then head down that dark corridor. One last secret spot here, that ladder to the Alpha door. Yes, you could have gotten this as early as meeting Cindy, 
but imagine having all that extra shotgun ammo to tempt you. Waste not, want not. The command center is Calamity Incarnate. Make a beeline to the large shutter door and don't look back. This hallway presents us with a fun puzzle. A wall of water shoves us back to the door. We can see a hose of some sort floating in there. Sprint inside and cut it with your knife, then activate the button to freeze the wall. Knife down the ice, and our path is clear. The lab hallway has two paths. Take the left first. We won't be able to loot properly until we finish up the lab section. Be warned this hallway respawns all enemies, including the scabs. The left path leads us to a scenic overlook of the lab. Nothing moving so far, it looks pretty clear. There's something strange about that boot. The control room beside us has a downstairs area with a save point and some more resupply. Going out the lab floor, we have escalators that can change directions and lots of items to pick up. Explore every corner, and if you think you can make that jump, you can. Take out the scabs, turrets, replicators, and hydras. Completely clear this place out before you get on this platform. know who I am? Well, I... I guess I have been locked up here. I am Dr. Falcon. You might say I'm its father. Okay, Doctor. So what is that thing? It's a stray lamb. It drifted through space and came to our planet 60,000 years ago. And it's alive. I have captured the first living extraterrestrial life form known to man. Extraterrestrial? Looks like a big chunk of meat to me. A chunk of meat? You must be joking. This is a magnificent specimen. That's okay. He doesn't seem to like you either. He's a rare and valuable treasure. Even the president doesn't know that he exists. Oh, beautiful. Are you cold, my son? I tried to raise the reactor core temperature for you, but these stupid marines got in the way. You raise the temperature? Okay, that's enough talk. We've got plenty of data, so we won't be needing you anymore. Shut your trap, you wacko. We're blowing this place up along with you, that bastard over there, and all your precious data. I can't let you do that. I'll kill you if it will save my precious. I'll do anything to save him. To save my baby, I'll do it for the love of my son. Crazy bastard. Now look, you've made him angry. He doesn't like you and your petty insults. I guess he didn't like you as much as you liked him. The big man himself. We've been reading this guy's crazed memos the past few hours. All he wants to do is maintain control of the Origin, an alien life form within a meteorite. While he did get his comeuppance, it feels like we were robbed of more to do with this character. If you didn't care for the memos, then this guy would have almost zero impact. Well, no time to question things. We just set the final detonator, and whatever exposition we can gather is useless. It's time to egress. 
This once calm lab is now a monster festival. Avoid the immediate ambush and quickly head up here. You're safe from all but hydras and you have a chance to snipe most big enemies. Some are out of view and can be baited to lower levels where they won't ever be a problem. This cheese spot gives us a chance to perform our own behavioral research. Aside from heights, they don't like stairs. When there's no immediate threat, they take naps. They're almost docile. Once you deem it safe, run and snag the items that appeared in the tanks. Save in the downstairs supply room and make sure to fill your battery completely. Time for the rest of that hallway. The door eats all 24 cells, but inside we get the final piece of armament, the Missile Launcher C. The Missile Launcher takes all of your attachment slots. It fires a slow speed, heavy damaging missile in a straight path. Massive damage against anything it touches. The biggest flaw though is when you fire a missile, pressing the fire button again makes it explode. This thing allows for user-determined detonation, and it ends up blowing up in your face if you're using it in a hurry. The reload is long, so you're at its mercy or you suffer damaging yourself mashing the button. Bad design. Shelve this thing for now. Now what this beast is trying to emulate is a weapon system based on the OICW. One part standard rifle, one part explosive launcher, all parts massive failure and scrap project. I drew the line at mimicking the sillier non-real world equipment, but as a consolation, I taped a roast beef sandwich with my Wii Remote grip to my SPR4. Step aside, Sig. The army has a new contender for a waste of money. With this in hand, we're ready to head to the evac point. Guys, we finished arming the detonators. Great. Where are you now? In the command center. We're leaving from the secret military dock at the end of underground tunnel area C. But the normal entrance is infested. You'll have to go around. Go through the underground storage area security room. I've unlocked the passage for you. Hurry. Okay. I'm on my way. I'll send the location data to your wireless terminal. The command center will be your last gauntlet of pain. Now it's tempting to use your saved at special ammo to make a comfortable escape, but strike that thought with extreme prejudice. Run. That's all you need to do. That little room in the cargo area that was always inaccessible is now our destination. Dennis! You made it! Thank God! Check out the SCAC! <laughs> you trying to take all of the glory? We can escape on this military hovercraft. This compound now is self-destruct. All personnel abandon posts immediately. Place their shelter in a remote location. I'll be right there. Hurry up, man! I don't want to be barbecued along with those damn monsters! We're almost there, Dennis. The LCAC. That's our ticket out of here. We can slow down or knock out all the enemies, with just your SPR4, mind you. There's lots of goods here, but avoid the LCAC platform, because that'll trigger a cutscene from which you can't return. We get a nice note that gives us some hope for the other survivors, including the reporter. We take one brief look back and appreciate our fortune. Over here, Dennis! away as we can. We'll decide where to go later. Are you okay? Oh, it isn't too bad. I'll look for some painkillers in the back. I wanted to tell you. What was that? I'll check. Cindy, Gary, and Dennis have successfully escaped Fort Stewart, though we can guess it's not over yet. We have time to move around the LCAC and pick up some items. There's two new pieces of equipment that we haven't seen before. 
a mounted M250 cal, which is an atrocious model, and a Humvee fitted with dual 20mm cannons. Both have no reticle or point of aim, so like the grenade launcher, now's the time to learn their capability. Grab all you can, and make sure you go through this door first to pick up some supplies. When you're ready, head through this door. Save, resupply, you know the drill by now. If it isn't our alien friend, looks like a father and son reunion. Guess what? It's time to finish both of you. And the origin and his misguided caretaker. Maybe the creature really did have a soft spot for the guy. This is the final boss of extermination. The reason we hoarded ammo and healing items. We will have to use what we learned throughout our plight to come out on top for this one. Origin appears as a giant shrimp-like creature that swims on both sides of the ship, only surfacing to spew several noxious bu- I, I wrote boobs. <laughs> Let me change that real quick. Only surfacing to spew several noxious blobs towards you. They have a pretty good track on them too. Hard to evade unless you're already on the move. The goal here is to hit the belly while it jumps up, but before it shoots out the blobs. Missing a cycle means Origin's next position is randomized, Getting a good hit though, will keep it in the same path for the next jump. The 20 mic cannons are a trap. They're too slow, and since you're boxed in with a slow animation, it'll be blob meal quickly. The machine gun is your second bet, if you can aim it properly. The machine gun can be destroyed if blobs hit it though, so be careful. The best way in my opinion, is using your rifle on automatic, and finally using that delta scope that tracks multiple targets. You can shoot the blobs out of the air, and since they only take one hit, you can feather the trigger if they come your way and still manage to hit the Origin's weak spot all in one burst. Just be prepared, this is the slowest route, but the safest. Another issue is ammo conservation and the lack of tactical reloads. You'll spit out 3-5 to five rounds before Origin gets damaged, around 10 or more if the blobs get out. But keep your rounds in mind, because the reload between a jumping and attacking means missed Origin and damage taken. Sometimes it's necessary to dump your remaining ammo for a fresh mag. Careful though, without your rifle ammo, you'll be forced to the machine gun, or worse, the 20 mics if the machine gun gets blown up. After a long string of volleys, the origin goes down. But it's not over yet. This is where a real slug match begins. Stick to the upper stories and watch out for the mutated hydras that will constantly spawn. The second form shoots blobs, missiles, and has a swipe attack that again deals massive damage. You will take damage, that is for sure. This is where you finally get to dig into your healing items. If your infection meter gets to 80+, plus, inject a booster B. Infection here is guaranteed death. No MTS machine to save you. Not only are healing items now unrestricted, it's time to use that six barrel grenade launcher. Hook up the red dot and send some hot potatoes down range. Watch Origin's pain states. This form does have invincibility after big damage, so don't waste your grenades. You'll most likely stand in place, take damage, and sling grenades. The machine gun, if still available, won't be usable shortly after a missile attack. Speaking of missiles, you'll probably run out of grenades. Piece together that missile launcher of your own and give it a few back. Reminder, don't blow these up in your face. Are you all right, Dennis? What the? Cindy, it's dangerous here. Get back inside.
legend now takes its final form, a resemblance of the being that has caused it so much trouble, Dennis. Complete with its own SPR-4, this final form is the last challenge you'll face. Origin's rifle deals significant damage, and the Hydras will do their best to annoy you. If you have missiles left, use them now. You're probably all out of SPR-4 ammo, but you should have some shotgun shells left. You're safe. Whoa. Oh, I see you finally made up. Gary, you're alive. I was worried. Hey, I'm invincible. Tough guys like me don't go down easy, you know. Where were you? I heard a noise and came out on deck. That giant shrimp grabbed me and threw me overboard. Luckily, my leg got caught in a rope before I hit the water. Ugh. Are you okay? Oh, it hurts just a little, but I'm cold and I'm wet, so I'm going inside. I'm sorry. It's okay. So, what were you talking about before, anyway? Talking about? You said you had something to tell me after this was all over. Oh. I'm sorry. Sorry? About what? About Andrew. I knew it was hard for you, too. You were best friends. Long before I met him, you must have been close. When Andrew died right in front of you, you must have been devastated. And I... I've been terrible to you. It's okay. I just... Just? I just hated myself for not being able to help you. So from now on, if you ever need anything from me, you let me know and I'll be there. This time I promise. Dennis. We're friends. Right? Right. Well then, let's go inside. It's cold out here. Thank you. We survive Fort Stewart. The origin and its strand are defeated. We have proof of the incident and the sacrifices of a few good men. Gary's alive and Cindy forgives us. Our futures are uncertain, but for now, we ride off into the sunset, having survived extermination. For about six hours, we infiltrated Fort Stewart, witnessed cosmic horrors, and defeated an apocalyptic alien menace. No sequel bait, all loose ends tied, a perfect little survival horror experience. The title comes from the in-game government plot that's very reminiscent of the original Resident Evil. The setting is a perfect homage to John Carpenter's The Thing, and it hits home for me because while they're used with extreme creative liberty, it's nice seeing Marines depicted in media in a way that's not historical. Are there questions left to be answered? Yes. What's with Andrew in this Cambodia mission? What is Cindy and Dennis's relationship? What was Andrew's relationship with her? Well, a little of this is actually explained in the manual. We have character bios of Dennis, Cindy, and Roger. This stuff really has no effect on the game, or its themes at all, other than saying how rad our marines are, and we learned that Cindy was Andrew's girlfriend. I mean, that was inferred, but never clearly stated. You could think Andrew was her brother, and the plot thread would still work. Roger really got shafted though. You're told and shown how close him and Dennis are, only for him to die before any real events happen. It's shocking regardless how he dies, but still, built up barely from the start, and his death doesn't really have the big impact I'm sure the developers wanted. Speaking of the manual, here's the back of the box. The absolute nads on them to print this. I don't think I've ever seen a gorier cover for a game ever. This cover gave me nightmares as a kid, and I still remember feeling queasy when the guy from Hastings pulled it out from behind the glass. If mom and dad weren't fighting, and dad didn't take me there to one-up mom by buying me a cool video game, I'm sure they would have thought twice about letting their seven-year-old gremlin touch this game. I always thought this was Roger, but this scene was never in the game. It also doesn't sell the game for what it is either. 
I mean, it's gross and terrifying for sure, but it looks like some sci-fi alien shooter scene, rather than the closer to reality body horror, extermination really is. Deep Space gambled on a hit for the launch of the PlayStation 2. At best, they made a solid, technically impressive, fun experience that ended promptly. Or at worst, a legacy of, oh I rented that once, it was pretty cool. Neither are the doomed bargain bin shovelware we might think of when we remember earlier obscure PlayStation 2 titles. Extermination is like a ska compilation. Half horrible noise, two or three good songs, but you might convince your friends to listen to it and bob a few heads before they ban you from the party speaker. Visually, Extermination looks very good for a PlayStation 2 game, especially an early title. It's not the cheap, overly plastic look, and it's not a grainy, blurry memory drainer or something like the SOCOM series. It's a perfect in-between. Areas are small enough to keep details serviceable and realistic, but minimalist. The larger places are either dark enough, and it fits the atmosphere, or it's shaded by what would be probably floating mists emanating from gore piles. We see a good chunk of Fort Stewart, and it does feel like a cohesive place that could actually function. The catwalks in the cargo area are a bit head-scratching, and the obvious what were they thinking with a water filtration plant are the only burrs on architecture. What we don't see, save for the bar, are living quarters of some sort. It's all business at Fort Stewart, but I'm sure some areas that could have highlighted where the average Joe spent his time away from work would have been more effective in painting a disaster. The monster models are fantastic. My favorite is definitely the mutated humanoid. The way their spines are exposed and the half-moon looking face sticks out of the chest is just perfect. The gunner is a cool looking hulking meatball with intimidating appendages and the dogs are 23 flavors of horror goodness. Dogs seem to have more moving parts, they writhe and split open, and they take little naps between hunting down their prey. The animations are crisp, even the facial expressions of Dennis and my favorite, the Major. His brows have a mind of their own. The NPCs are a little stiff, but if they need to move or do something, at least they're human with it. The only NPCs you see are static, no one follows you and you're on your own all game. That's a limitation most likely due to processing power and all that nerd stuff, but it's also not a good excuse for major chunks of exposition being left to memos and documents found. Even then those are kind of useless. For example, we read Dr. Falcon's research papers on HO213 and shortly after he greets us and says more of the same with extra crazy sprinkled on top. Do it for the love of my son. Characters get introduced very abruptly, half your marine team is never seen, and the few that you do meet have little to no interaction with you. Other than Gary, Roger, and Philel, we see McDonald, but he doesn't say a word to us. I guess he's seen the same amount of times as Philel, arguably more useful than Philel, but it's such a shame to know that you have marines alive and you're on your own without it ever getting more personal. I want to know how McDonald feels about the situation. Everyone shrugs off Roger's death save for the Major. The drama that should ensue after learning your team is getting slaughtered would be that much critical to the atmosphere of disparity. The closest we get to that is when Sony is found grafted to the wall, just shy of Sanctuary. Dennis never told Cindy, and there could have been a great moment after we notice her body disappears. Seeing her come back as a monster in front of Cindy, that's the Michelin star, top shelf horror this game needed. Now let's talk about voice acting. The script is serious but voiced very goofily, and Dennis's icy cliff lines are B-movie tier gold. The lip syncing is unforgivably bad in the first parts of the game, but they get better for some reason the further you play. Some lines are stretched out, which I think was an attempt to fix the lip syncing, but that just makes it worse. Dennis is cardboard incarnate for quieter scenes, but when things get more intense, he really sells distress. Cindy and the others play their part well, bonus points for Gary. It's a Japanese developer, there's a little bit of unintentional magic with his voice direction. 
The Major is by far the best acted. A true Shakespearean. He sounds like a man I'd gladly admit to spending all my money on e-bike and vending machine snacks instead of getting a haircut last Sunday. We don't hear the other Marines unless it's a frantic radio call, which is a shame. The music is a mixed bag. When it's slow, it's some of the best music in the genre. Good synths and strings. But man, what a strange take with the faster tunes. The Danger Close music stings fall a bit flat, and for some reason, while listening to the soundtrack alone, I swear it sounded like Legend of Dragoon's OST, but it's most likely a side effect of tritium poisoning. Squishes, squeals, and screams makes up a good library of sound effects. The SPR-4 sounds like a worthy machine of war, and the shotgun is one of the best shotgun blasts in gaming. Very serviceable, non-grading effects. What helps with all these sounds is that space matters. Large areas can echo, and all effects have a range. If there's an enemy around, they'll let you know. Notice by now how many times I said to use the flamethrower? Good, I haven't. It kills me to say it, but it's useless. If you think there's a good use, there's something better. For a last ditch resort or Hydra Slayer, it'll work, but you'll probably just stick to the rifle due to its infinite resupply. There's not a lot of opportunities to use the grenade launcher or missile launcher. The end boss is the reason. It's a fight won by surplus, so being stingy is necessary. That being said, you'll mostly use all your gear at one point, nothing left to pasture. To cap off a loose end, what about Roger's M249 saw? Why can't we pick that up? Well, it was fused to him after he was infected. We can see it during the reactor fight. The overall downsides, I'll just list here. Short length of play, shallow plot depth, poor character backgrounds, mostly linear, goofy acting, ill-fitting music at times, control slash camera issues, and it's a game where you have to hoard items for the final fight. Whoa, it sounds like I just completely dunked on the game. None of these will tank your experience, I promise. It's 99 proof fun for the time invested. Oh yeah, the collectibles. Dog tags. If you collect them all, including Roger's knife, your save file turns yellow with the star. Starting a new game here gives us a new game plus, where ammo and meds are a care of the past. Run through the game one more time with near infinite special ammo and stronger enemies. Good times. My thoughts are pretty well known by now. I love this game and I highly recommend it to anyone interested. I'm not sure what the emulator market is like, but PS2s are still abundant and the game shouldn't be more than 15 bucks at your local store. But what makes Extermination so special to me is that it was introduced to me in the same Starry Age stage of life as Legend of Dragoon was, pretty much the same way as well. Both were found on jam packs and had their own special videos which I fawned over for years until I got the real deal. Definitely cemented my love for firearms as well, in a healthy way, don't take that weird. Who knows, maybe it wormed its way into my subconscious so deep it made me join the Marines. The Air Force used Area 51 to sell gamers, so maybe Archibald Henderson snuck this into my local store like a crayon eating Santa. Now if you'll excuse me, I have several fires to put out. Thanks for watching, and sorry for the second massive hiatus. As the Golden Enlightened may know, I recently graduated college. A tech college, I'm not here to sound cool. Moving across the country, kicking off a new job, and home improvement have been a top priority. I appreciate the patience, and now that I've settled in, I'll cook up some more videos. I know this isn't Cruelty Squad, and that's been my number one theme on this channel, but who knows? We like to experiment on here, even if it means we lose some steam. Regardless, thank you all for the support, and as always, stay safe, make good choices, and maintain that 10-year plan. I'll see you guys next time. Semper Fi. Go out there and show the world what Marines are made of. Yes, sir!